kone bu pirima rekaele morena kawena reka ema ratwarana Waar die wilgers welig spruit, door een boom sy skaries vry, soos ons groei en kindigheid, mag u ons vry. Sien ons hoe hier, lei met die hand, laat u sien, rus voor ons vry. Strong streams, united flow, every curse and proud and tall. As we learn, we trust, we know, God is in control. Bless us, O Lord, guide us with grace. To everyone who is here this evening, it is a great privilege to be part of this wonderful occasion where we are to experience Prof. Ma and also where we are to be encouraged by what she has accomplished thus far. May the Lord of grace bless us. May we read a few verses from the Bible before we pray. I'm reading from Romans chapter 11, verse 36, and Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I'm reading from the King James Version. For we him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body's living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I just want to highlight a few things from this passage that we have read this evening. In that passage we read, there are three challenges and three reasons why we should glorify God. And that's what I want to focus on for a few minutes. Three challenges why we should glorify God. According to the text that we have read that is written by Apostle Paul, he was writing for the church in Rome writing to share with them how to be right with God or how to have a right standing with God at that particular time. And as I will be highlighting these three challenges, the first challenge that we are going to look at is we are, we are challenged to present our bodies to God. Present our bodies to God as living sacrifices holy and acceptable unto him. What does that mean? This means we need to offer our whole being to honor and glorify God. God expects 
every living being to give his body to him. Presenting our bodies to God as living sacrifice carries the idea of total commitment and devotion to God. God expects devotion from living, living people. God expects all to set their bodies apart for his own glory. God wants his people to set their, part, their, their lives or their bodies apart. It means to separate their bodies from evil to serve God. You separate yourself from evil and you give the parts of your body to honor and glorify God. Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 6, verse 13, he, he, reads, he writes and says, Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer your body as instruments of righteousness. We live in a corrupt, fallen world, broken lives, and God wants his people to commit themselves to him and serve him totally. The second challenge, the second challenge is do not conform to the pattern of this world. We are challenged not to allow this world to squeeze us into its corrupt mold. This is what God challenges us to do. If we are going to glorify God, we need to make a decision to despise evil, to make a decision to refuse to be influenced by the principles that do not help us to be who we were made to be. Because any corrupt thing will delay you to become the best that you were born to be. Because every one of us is here to mark the world and impact the world with something. But if we get involved in things that corrupt us and defile us and contaminate us, even the light that people saw from us will grow dim because they will no more see the good that we have done and the great things that we have done. Now they will begin to look at those little spots of evil that we got ourselves involved in. Therefore, please, do not allow this world to squeeze you into its corruption. Don't allow those things to do that. Refuse to yield the various parts of your body to worldliness, such as greed, selfishness, expediency, filthy language, sexual immorality, and corruption, revenge, and planning to bring others down. That's not it's not what's supposed to be found in us as the light of the world. For I believe as an institution of education, we are the light. We bring light where there is darkness. We bring knowledge which enlightens people and make them better. But if we get ourselves involved and we allow the world to squeeze us and to mold us, into that which we are not. We miss the mark. We live below who we are. We live below our standard, for we are called to be different. Be different. The third challenge that we find in this text is be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What does it mean? This, it means this. Align and yield your mind to God's way of thinking. Whenever God thinks about you, he doesn't think evil. He does not think how he may bring you down. He thinks peace. He thinks prosperity. 
He wants to lift you up and make you a great person that you were born to be. Whenever God thinks about each one of us who are seated here, he thinks the best of us. Please think the best of others. Think like God thinks. Bend down and pick the fallen and lead them to a higher place in their lives because you were born to be a shoulder where the weak can, can lean on, where you can take them to a better place in life. What does it mean? It means to consciously and decisively submit and subject your mind to God's will according to his eternal principles. Because when you, when you violate a principle, it violates you. You cannot violate a principle and remain intact. Therefore, please, please, I beg you, please, be renewed in your mind. Think the way God thinks about people and about you. Because he, he thought so well about us, he gave us his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, that he may pick us up and make us better people. Because of time, let me go to the two reasons why we should glorify God. Number one, reason why we should glorify God. God created all things, and he created them out of nothing. When there was nothing, there was God. And God spoke these things to be that we see and that we don't see. We need to understand that the visible and, and invisible, they come from the hand of God and they come from the breath of God. He breathed and they came into being. God created everything. The Bible tells us God is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. There is nothing outside of God. And there will never be anything outside of God. So please, make sure that you recognize this creator who created you and loved you so much. The second reason, because of time. Because of God's mercy. Because of his mercy. God, because of his mercies, he has given each one of us chances to start again. When we fall, he stands there by us. Because of his mess, he sends people that you don't even know. And those that you knew and thought they would be there for you. And they will never be there. But God comes along and he brings people to pick you up. Therefore, please, don't be like the Israelites. The Israelites, after they conquered Jericho, they thought they did it in their own power, in their strength. And, and after they, 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 they conquered the place, they forgot who gave them ability to conquer. And they proceeded without going back to God to inquire what God is saying about. And they were defeated by a small village called Ai. When they, 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 they went to spy AI, when they came back, they said, it is, it is just a small village. Send 300 men, and those men were killed because they were foolish. They, they put God outside of their plans. And it is of great importance that as you, you, you progress in life, don't forget God. Don't forget God. You might think it's because you are determined you might think it is because you are wise. I think you have observed in the world the most wisest people baking in the streets. Some of them you went to school with, but when you look at them, because some of them decided, I am wise, I'm intelligent, I don't need this God, and I can do it without him. Psalms 53 verse 1 and Psalms 14 verse 1 says, A fool says in his heart, there is no God. A fool denies God. He depends in his own strength. The Bible says, Cursed is a man who trusts the arm of the flesh. Anyone who trusts his strength, the Bible says he's cursed. You know what does it mean? You are cursed. It means you are castrated. 
The, your ability to produce is taken away from you. May the Lord of grace and mercy be with you all. May God's hand rest upon you. May his face shine upon you and make you the people that you, you are meant to be. You have touched lives. You have blessed people. Please do not dim the light. Do not cause the light to grow dim. Continue to walk as God planned your lives. May the Lord of grace bless you. Let me pray. Gracious Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, here are your people. We are grateful for the opportunity that you gave us. May the blood of your son, Christ, be upon us as we sit here this evening. We are grateful that you have allowed us to come. Bless this occasion. Bless it beyond this day. May everyone who has been, who came to this occasion, live with your grace and mercy and with your love and your goodness. In Christ's mighty name, Lord, we have prayed. Amen. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, Pastor, for the beautiful word um, this evening. Colleagues, it's my privilege to do the official welcoming on this uh, occasion. So, good evening. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this special occasion, the inaugural address of Professor Shazal Ma. I would like to express a warm welcome, firstly, to Prof. Daryl Barlia, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Information Technology and Campus Operation, Pochestroom Campus, Reverend Pastor Edward Seleke, Professor Daniel Metzeleng, Deputy Director of the School of Economic Science, various Deputy Directors and Directors within the Faculty of Economic and Management Science. Welcome to colleagues from the three campuses of the Faculty of Economic and Management Science. Colleagues from other faculties of the Northwest University. And I would also like to do a special welcome to colleagues from the University of the Western Cape, Walter Sisulu University, University of Johannesburg, Tswane University of Technology, and other universities represented friends, family, and a special um, welcome to Prof. Zal's husband, Dr. Paul Saar. Her children were the three J's, Joella Kefehing Saar, her daughter and first child, Joshua Sifor Saar, her first son, second child, and Jeffrey Fofieng Saar, her second son and last child, as well as the two cousins, Professor Paul Kamta and Eric Czech Kamta. Today is a proud and joyful occasion for the Faculty of Economic and Management Science and all of us present. Inaugural addresses are an essential component of the university's public events program, helping to create a broader awareness of the latest developments in research in the faculty and university. It also provides the platform for a university to showcase its academics, introduce them to the academic and non-academic uh, community of the university, and allow engagement with the public. The faculty is also um, proud and allows the induction of these candidates to answer for herself regarding her position and contribution to a chosen subject field. The Faculty of Economic and Management Science is privileged to have five staff members presenting inaugural addresses this year in various disciplines. And I think, Prof. Ma, I, if I'm not mistaken, you're the last in the row. Professor Jazal? You can celebrate a significant personal milestone with family, 
with friends, previous and current colleagues. The, this inaugural address allows the university to recognize and showcase your academic achievements. Tonight, you will share your research interest with your colleagues within the faculty and also with the broader community. Ladies and gentlemen, I've always had interesting conversations with Prof. Zal. Today, I'm sure that you are looking forward to the inaugural, the sustainability of sovereign debt in South Africa is debt good or bad? At this point, I would request Prof. Daniel Metzeling, the Deputy Director of the School of Economic Science, to introduce Prof. Zizal Ma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Prof. Verona. And all protocol has been well observed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. I thought I was alone, so <laughs> yeah, very, very serious. My role here tonight, good people, is to give highlights of a journey thus far. My role is simply to tell how she made it thus far to the pinnacle of her career. And she will further expand on how she made it possible, the simplest, easy way. Pastor, I thought I should steal from you the book of, of, of the, 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 the big book, the book, one verse or two. I, I, know, I know Giselle is a Christian, so she will not be offended if I do so. Luke 5, verse 1 and 2. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesat, the people were just crowding around him and listening to the word of God. The second verse says, He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen. The key to my message, who were washing their nets. Who were washing their nets? When, when, I, when I looked at Prof. Ma's journey, the, the, the failed trip to the UK, because every day we look at the, the, what you call abroad, overseas, as the place to be. Prof. Ma never washed the nets. In football language, whenever a team gets knocked out of a tournament, we say they washed their jersey as a sign of having given up, of having not proceeded with the tournament, she did not wash her net. She continued, as the Lord told her, like he did with Simon Peters, that go unto the deep waters and catch. He says, Master, for you say so. I'm sorry I'm getting into the mood. <laughs> I will comply. And they went and caught large sum of fish to an extent of signaling the other boat to come and do likewise. She did not wash the net. Giselle Ma was born into the family of the late Mr. Bon Boniface Chifo and Miss Vivian Alimbo Chifo on the 9th January 1984. Can I repeat that? On the 9th of January. 1984. Not, not so long ago, I was, I was introducing the one who was born 1982. And that, for me, is a big, big achievement. 1984. That deserves a round of applause. <laughs> in Mbu village, in the northwest region of Cameroon, she's the first child out of six and devoted Christians. She attended the government bilingual primary school in Bofosan, Cameroon, and obtained her GCE ordinary level certificate in 2001. She proceeded to start Light College, Nguyen, Cameroon, where she obtained her advanced level in 2003. Giselle enrolled at the University of Bio, Cameroon, in 2003 and graduated in 2006. 
with a Bachelor of Science in Economics. I think the 2003 also marks another milestone, but listen as I go down. She later moved to South Africa for her postgraduate studies in 2011. She was awarded a BCom Honors Degree in Economics with distinction in April 2012, and Master of Commerce in Economics with distinction again in April 2013, and a doctoral degree in Economics in October 2015 at the Northwest University in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences in quick succession. <laughs> she started working as an intern at the Rural Investment Credit uh, Bafosam, Cameroon, a financial institution from July 2005 to October 2006, a very short stint. After completing her degree, she was employed as a public relations officer from October 2006 to July 2007 in RIC. She was sent to open a new branch where she later became a branch manager from July 2007 to August 2009. She was promoted to be the regional manager in RIC in September 2006 before she left to further her studies in the United Kingdom. She could not further her studies because of circumstances beyond her control Therefore, she returned to Cameroon. She later moved to South Africa and became a graduate assistant in 2011, in 2011, from a regional manager to a graduate in ten, in assistant. In, 2000, in 2013, she was facilitator at Technicon College in Denver, Mafeking. She was appointed as a lecturer in economics from February 2013 to December 2017. Sorry, to December 2015. Promoted to senior lecturer from January 2016 to December 2017. A promote, and promoted to associate professor from January 2018 to December 2022. A promotion to full professor from January 2023. Very quick succession. Giselle is a productive scholar. Her research interest in, is in public economics, macroeconomics, development economics, and applied econometrics. After obtaining her PhD in October 2015, she successfully supervised to completion five doctoral students at the Northwest University. She also successfully supervised 10 master's students at the Northwest University. Giselle is currently supervising nine PhD students, including two uh, staff members in the Department of Economics and the School of Economic Sciences. She has successfully mentored a number of staff members in the department. She has published more than 28 articles in accredited journals, two book chapters, she has presented more than 11 papers in local and international conferences. Giselle has a two, 247 Google citation and an age index of 7.6. She was also the guest editor of the Journal of Reviews and Global Economics, where she handled the submissions, appointment of reviewers, and finalized the publication of the special issue in 2019. That is one of the prestige in academia. She was associate editor of the Journal of Advances in Management Sciences and Information Systems and reviewer for several journals in her field. Giselle has researched collaborations with colleagues from the University of Bue, Cameroon, Concordia University, Canada, and the University of Namibia, amongst others. She's a member of the following professional bodies, the Economic Society of South Africa, the Econometric Society of Economic and Economic Research of Southern Africa. She has obtained some awards and recognitions as follows. Vice Chancellor's Award for Developing Female Researcher in October 2019. <laughs> Teaching Excellence Award in October 2016. Certificate of Recognition as the best master's student 
by APSA Bronze Medal in Economics, Human and Social Science at the Northwest University in October 2013. The Dean's Merit for obtaining the first place Master of Commerce in Economics at Mafeking Campus in 2013. And lastly, the Dean's Merit for obtaining first place Honours Bachelor of Commerce in Economics at the Mafeking Campus in 2012 May. She has been the program leader of the Department of Economics since 1st May 2022. She acted as a program leader from 1st June 2021 until 30th April 2022. She, was, she has acted as a deputy director, School of Economic Sciences, for a few weeks in 2021 and 2023. She has been the chairperson of the Economics Colloquium for all three campuses from 1st February 2021 to December 2022. She has been the Scientific Committee's core member in the School of Economic Sciences from January 2020. In addition, she is a faculty high degrees committee member sharing from, starting from 1st June 2021. She has also been a member of the Postgraduate Selection Committee in the Economics Department from, May, from, from 2019 to date. She met the love of her life, Dr. Paul Saul. So, in... In, in October 2003, that's, that's the milestone I spoke about, the university milestone. Good things happened, Prof. Verona, at the universities. Very good things happened there with good intentions. Uh, and Prof. Verona alluded to the fact that they were married in 2006 and were blessed with three children, the three J's. Good people, please assist me as we put our hands together to welcome <laughs> Professor Giselle Ma to the fore. Vice Chancellor, Prof. Tobeka Bismarck in absentia, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Information Technology and Campus Operation, Purchase from Campus, Prof. Daria Balia, and other Deputy Vice Chancellor in absentia, that is Prof. Linda Duplicit, Prof. Jeffrey, and Prof. Bafo. Members of Council, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Management Sciences, Prof. Babs in absentia, the Deputy Dean, Research and Innovation, Prof. Verona, and other Deputy Dean in absentia, which is Prof. Tebu Moroka, Prof. Herman van der Meer, and Prof. Herman van der Meer. The Director of the School of Economics and Management Sciences, Prof. Vernon Kobler in absentia, the Deputy Director of the School of Economics and Management Sciences at Mafiken Campus, Prof. Dan Mitileng, and the other direct, deputy directors in Asemsha, which is Prof. Herman and Prof. Steve Dunga. Colleagues of the Department of Economics, School of Economics and Management Sciences, Northwest University, and other universities. Friends, family, my pastor, Reverend E.G. Seleka, distinguished guests, students, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observe. Good evening, Jumela. Gradner, welcome to this inaugural lecture today, titled The Sustainability of Sovereign Debt in South Africa. Is debt good or bad? Before I start with my lecture today, I want to thank God for being my Lord and personal Savior. He has brought me this far. There have been a lot of challenges in my life, but like Prof. Dan alluded to that, I never gave up. I want to thank my husband for always being there for me since 2003. 
<laughs> Diversity, Prof. Mitile, <laughs> until date. He believed in me, and he always stand in, even being there for the children when I'm not around. I want to thank my wonderful children, the three J's, Joella, Joshua, and Jeffrey. I want to thank my mother, who is not able to be here today because of other commitment and my siblings. They are the pillar of my strength. I want to thank my father-in-law and my late mother-in-law. He was the backbone for me to come and do honors. Imagine going to study. I couldn't study, and I come back ground zero. I had to start from ground zero. I know what it means to start from zero level. So I want to thank him for that. And I also want to thank my father. There are two things I want to thank my father for. Firstly, I was born in a community or a society where when you give birth to a female child, it's like you don't have a child. They will pressurize the man to have a male child. And as a result, that pressure was on my father to a point where they had to look for another woman. But luckily, it didn't happen. He could not. He didn't yield to that. But one thing about my father was that he loved his female children so much. And he always tell me, Giselle, I don't have a male child. You have to do this. So he raised me not only as a female child, but as a male child. He said, I don't have a male child. But later on, God gave him male children. Another thing, again, which my father did was that he always called me his doctor. And I grew up, I'm very good in math. With figures, I'm very good. But I had a challenge with biology is that I will read, then when I come to write, I forget. So it was so difficult. And now I had to change from that dream of being a doctor that my father kept calling me. I had to go and apply to do accounting. But I don't even know. I don't know how the application process went to. I have a helper, a destiny helper always in my life who always comes in. He came and reapplied. You will know him later. And I just found I was admitted to do economics. I did economics. When I had my degree, my father kept calling me my doctor. And I'm wondering, is it because he's not educated? Why is he calling me doctor? So, but I didn't understand. I only understood that in 2012 when he passed on. When he passed on, that was when I understood the doctor my father was calling me was an academic doctor, not the medical doctor. So it pushed me from when he passed on to do my master's and do my PhD. You see, I did my master's one year, PhD two and a half, because... Now I got to realize that prophecy, and I, it had to be fulfilled. And before, and before my father passed on, there is also Dr. Yota Daniel, whom I met in 2010. He was my spiritual father then. Then he also took over the role of a father in my life. I remember every year you write, we have to set goals, and he would tell me, what, what does it take to be maybe a doctor or an associate professor? I'll tell him and he'll set those goals and he'll give me target. And after six months, he will have to review it and he will check that to make sure I get here. So he has been playing that role till today. He's not able to be here today because he's on mission, because he's a World Health Organization medical doctor. But he has played that role of a father and has pushed me to be here. So without waste of time, this is how the structure of my presentation looks like. I'll talk about what motivated me to do this research. I will talk about a bit of introduction to debt, sovereign debt situation around the world, in Africa, in South Africa, and measures of debt reduction. I'll also talk about the sustainability of sovereign debt, debt sustainability in South Africa, debt threshold, and is debt good or bad, and conclusion. In 2005, uh, what motivated me was that in 2005, when I was doing my third year, we were taught about the highly indebted poor country which was launched by then in 1996 by the IMF and the World Bank. And the aim of this initiative was that they wanted to ensure that poor, in quotes, as you see I put in quote, countries, which face unmanageable debt burden could be able to, to come out of that. And by 2005, when I was doing my, my third year, the multilateral debt relief initiative now was implemented to accelerate the sustainability of the development goal. So many economics during that period, had to talk about the highly indebted poor countries. And this initiative allowed countries who completed the HIPIC initiative process to receive a 100% relief of, a, of debt relief so that they could be eligible for funds from the IMF, the World Bank, and the African Development Fund. And by then, I believe that 
African countries were poor. And I see put in quotes, poor, you understand as I proceed with my lecture. Then come 2008, it was the, the dead financial crisis. Now, this financial crisis affected many European countries, and Greece was one of them. And by 2010, Greece received the first bailout package, whereby that bailout package was to help them to not to go into debt in an unreasonable manner. Hence, by 2012, they got the second bailout of about, to the tune of about 130 euros, billion euros. And they also went further to implement austerity measures. And it baffled me. The same European country that called African countries poor, and now the one experiencing a lot of debt, rising debt, they are unable even to pay their debt, and they are, experienced, they are busy implementing austerity measures. When we talk about austerity measures, it's when expenses are cut down, while tax, taxes are being raised. They are the one implementing this. And I wonder, but why? And despite the fact that Greece received those bailouts and did and implemented the austerity measure, it still struggled and wanted to default its debt. And now decided to say, maybe let me go, let me dig deeper into this issue. That was when I wrote a book chapter titled Causes, Consequences, and the Cure of the, Soro, so, of the Eurozone Sovereign Debt Crisis. Alongside, I was also doing my master's degree titled An Econometric Analysis of the Eurozone Sovereign Debt Crisis, the Case of Greece. Thereafter, I thought maybe the situation is stable. But now, not only was Europe being affected, but most power economy around the world, they themselves started reviewing their fiscal policy. US, for example, had to reduce and have a deficit target or a primary deficit target of 1.7% of GDP. And that was in 2013. So most of them now started to tighten their fiscal policy so that the debt situation should not be severe. I then decided to explore further why the, the, the reduction in expenditure and increase in tax. And that is what led me, I did my PhD title, Sovereign Debt and Fiscal Consolidation in the United States of America and Greece, a comparative approach. And since then, my research has focused more on debt situation in Africa and South Africa in particular. But what I've realized over the years is that sovereign debt problem can affect any country, either developing or developed countries. Given the role played by the new development bank, the World Bank, the IMF, the, which is the International Monetary Fund, and many international organizations, the credibility of the, a, a country's monetary authority is very important. And that credibility is being determined by the capacity of that authority to be able to service its debt payment, or for them not to be able to default or to restructure their debt. So that is how it is measured. And when we talk about debt, as you look at that picture, you could see when you talk about debt, it involves a lot of things. You have debtors, creditors, interest rate, finance, institution, and a lot, of, a lot more. So, but what is debt? Debt is an obligation. It's money that someone owes you and it has to be paid. And these debts could be owed by an individual, an institution, or a country. But the focus of today's lecture is on sovereign debt, which is the debt of a country. But before I proceed, let me have some few de definitions so that you follow me. When we talk about sovereign debt, it is the amount of money that a country has borrowed. And they, they, a country borrowed by issuing bonds and treasury bills. And when you talk, also you have, you hear of domestic debt is the debt which the government borrow from within the country. Why foreign debt is debt borrowed from other government or, or other foreign, in, uh, uh, foreign investors or lenders. Then also you hear we we'll talk about debt service. It is the amount of interest that is paid on the debt that is borrowed. Austerity measure, as I mentioned, is also a situation where there is a cut in expenditure and an increase in taxation. And most of the time, it is being implemented during econ an economic situation or condition. Debt crisis is when you see economic and financial situation problems in an economy. And when we talk about debt sustainability, it is an obligation which a country has to make and make sure that they do not have accumulated areas. The last one is debt threshold. That threshold is, is that limit 
of what a government can borrow. And when it goes beyond the limit, it the debt becomes detrimental to the growth of that country. So with that noted, sovereign debt, when you hear the word sovereign debt, is the same as government debt, is the same as public debt, is the same as central debt, is the same thing. And this sovereign debt or government debt or public debt is related also to a country's interest rate and how they, they, these obligations are being paid off. And that is why you see that there are several agencies that will always have to check the credibility of a country to always assess and they'll tell you, no, this country is credit worthy or not because of certain measures, the way they pay their debt. And for this, re and also, there are countries, or countries also who have the good debt. After they have assessed the country's debt and the interest payment and how they manage the debt, they'll be able to say, okay, this country is a good country, it's credible. And most stable economy, which have a, a economic stability and political stability, are viewed as having a better credit, credit worthiness. And because of the good credit worthiness of that country, it allows them to borrow more and at a favorable rate, hence the interest rate is not that much as a country which is not as such. So when we look at the IMF and the World Bank, they also develop a framework for sustainability to make sure countries, even though they borrow, should remain within a certain level of sustainability. I want us to look at debt situation around the world. When we look at sovereign debt, sovereign debt comes as a result of a deficit. When we talk about deficit, it is the situation where the expenditure of that country is more than the revenue. So, and because expenditure is more than the revenue, most of these countries now tend to borrow in order to meet up the expenses. And there has been an ongoing debate about government debt. Is it good in financing infrastructure or consumption spending? But when you look at the COVID-19, it made most government around the world to borrow. In the past, in 1996, there was this growth and stability part that was established, whereby they said deficit should not be more than 30%, and debt should not be more than 60%, that is debt to GDP ratio. But with the COVID-19, as you see what the statistics I'll show you, many countries went into debt, both developed and underdeveloped countries. So let's go to that figure. I hope you can see the figure. You see on the vertical axis, these are the countries. And on the horizontal axis, it is the debt, the central debt as a percentage of GDP. And when you look here, ironically, remember I started to say they said African countries were poor because they, high, they had a high debt and they were tagged poor countries, highly indebted poor countries. But when you look at the debt to GDP ratio, when you look, look at US, it has it above the 100% of debt to GDP ratio. Look at uh, 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 Iceland, it's above that. Belgium, France, Spain, United Kingdom. Greece is 200%, more beyond the 200% of debt to GDP ratio. Croatia is the worst, it goes to 600% of debt to GDP ratio. And on the same picture as you see, something is common. When you look, the yellow is, the, is in 2020. The COVID-19 in economics will talk about a shock. When something affects in an, a, an economy in, in, a, like in a short period of time, which is what was unexpected, we say the shocks. And you could quite actually see the shocks of the COVID-19 here. You see it is the yellow. COVID-19 took place mid-2019, towards the end of 2019. And you could see that most government, you conclude that every country went into debt, as you see. You see in Zambia, the yellow is 2020. Look at the yellow color. So most of the countries went into debt during the COVID-19 pandemic in order to cap that situation. And thereafter, because it was a shock, you could see that after 2020, 2021, most of them, you could see a decrease because the COVID-19 was just a shock in that economy. And now you could see that decrease over the year. So, but there is an irony here. You see here, look at South Africa. The debt is less than, it's somewhere around 60% of debt to GDP ratio. Look at most African countries, Malaysia, Mongolia. It is far below 60, 50% of debt to GDP ratio. And those are the same countries which were said were the highly indebted poor, that word poor countries. 
But now, look at another irony in the next graph. This is the interest payment on debt as an expense. The first graph showed that most of the European country in particular had debt higher than highest debt around the world and higher than the debt to GDP ratio. But look at it, look at the interest payment. Countries with the highest interest payment are African countries. You see Sri Lanka, Brazil, Malawi, Kenya, Malaysia, most of South Africa, most of that. And the mo most of the countries with the highest debt around the world was the, are the European countries. But look at the interest payment as a percentage of, ex uh, of the expenses. You see their, their interest payment are very low. Look at France, Belgium, Italy, and Austria. So you could see, and another irony again is, look also with that, that shock of 2019 and 2020, the yellow, the interest payment as well for most of those countries were, were low. It's like the lenders were a bit considerate. That maybe because it's a COVID-19, let's not maintain the high interest rate, let's reduce. And that is why you see most of those countries, the yellow is, is lower. So I started asking myself, European countries, high debt to GDP ratio. When it comes to interest rate on the payment of the debt, they have the low waste amount. But as we proceed, you understand why. Let's go down to the European country. If you see on this figure, most, the, high, the countries with the highest debt ratio were mostly the European countries. And why this? In Europe, there was a Eurozone sovereign debt crisis. And that crisis started in 2009, whereby there was, a, 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 whereby there was the, the island bank, the Iceland banking system was also becoming faulty. And during this period, the they, 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 they they, they financial institution were collapsing. There was rising government debt and bond heel. You even see even houses, mortgages, a lot of things were happening around them. And the most affected countries were Iran, Italy, Greece, and Portugal, which are collectively called the peak institution. And you could also clearly see that in 2013, most, not only even most European countries and others started to review their physical policy. They started to check their expenditures and revenue. And because remember, debt comes from that increase in monthly expenditure whereby the revenue is not able to cater for that expenditure. So now they started to check their physical policy. But the most prominent causes of the sovereign debt crisis was the rising government debt, trade imbalances, monetary policy, flexibility, loss of confidence, and recession. This was what happened in Europe. Let's go to Africa. In Africa, the debt crisis instead started in the 1960s and 1970s. And if you remember, most African countries got independence in the 90s, in the 1960s. And they had to borrow money in order to be able to maintain the political and economic situation. But they could not honor that, their debt obligation. And because they could not honor the debt obligation in the 1970s, the Paris and London Club uh, initiative was formed, whereby the lender now agreed to say, these countries who cannot pay this debt, let them be called, let create an initiative to help them. And that is where the highly indebted poor country, HIPIC initiative started. And it was endorsed by the IMF and the World Bank. And the intention for this was just to establish some conditions of debt relief, whereby they could be able to to pay their debt and not go beyond certain expectation. But still, there was a struggle. And by, in 1999, there was an introduction of the Colony Debt Initiative, whereby this initiative provided a faster, a broader, excuse me, and a deeper debt relief. And most of these repeat initiate countries, who were, which were termed poor, in quote, had to try to implement such and be able to meet some of these obligations. And some receive approximately 130 pounds by then, about 70% of them. And within three years, most of those nations under that HIPIC initiative expanded to 38 countries. And six of them fulfilled those conditions and got relief from both initiatives. And also 20 others were added to that. But nevertheless, it is understandable that 
every economy needs debt and it also has the performance of an economy does affect. But there is an author, Rogoff and uh, Rehan and Rogoff, 2010. They, they, they try to categorize debt in a certain regime to say when debt is say below 30% of GDP, is you say it's low debt. Medium term, uh, medium, between 30 and 60, you talk about the low medium. And when it's 60 and 90, is a high medium. But when debt is above 90%, you talk about high debt. But high debt. And so, but you could see from the graph above that most African countries are even in the low or the low medium or the high medium, but not the high debt level. So let's look at the case of South Africa as well, which is our focus for today. When you look at South Africa, the fiscal policy decision in South Africa, for them to determine those policies, they need to look, it is the government who is in charge. They look at the government expenditure, the taxation, the borrowing, and what this is used for. And South Africa deficit is the main cause of the debt. And this is because the, the expenditure which they the, the money which they spend, they don't have enough revenue to meet up. And hence the deficit, the debt in South Africa is more as a result of the deficit. And this, and it is written by Kalodikwe and Ma that increase in that budget commitment to different sectors requires the government to have enough revenue in order to ensure that there is no deficit in the budget. But historically, you see in South Africa that expenditure has been increasing over the years, more than the revenue will go debt. But also, there is another issue before I take you to the deficits graph, whereby they, because the debt is increasing, remember when they, um, be it the foreign nation or whosoever, they don't borrow money for free, you pay an interest rate. But the terms could be favorable or not favorable, you pay an interest rate. And looking at the case of South Africa, the debt service, when debts are high, it means the debt service as well will be high. And when it is high, what does it mean? Expenditure also increases. And it has an effect on the economy because that money which could have been used to produce or to do other things is now used to pay off some of the debt interest rate. And as you could see from the National Treasury statistics, you could gradually see 20, 2008, 2009, you could gradually see that Debt, the interest payment is constantly increasing. And despite the fact that in 2020, the, 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 the term of interest rate it was lower, but you could see that much amount went for the public debt interest rate service. And those debt arises because of this. Look at this graph. You could see the percentage of uh, the national government expenditure as a percentage of GDP here from 0 to 35% of GDP. And here is a period. Over the years, you, this green line is the revenue, is the expend, is the revenue. The blue is the expenditure. And you clearly see that over the years, the very revenue has always been more than the expenditure. Sorry, has always been more than the revenue. Hence, the government over the years has been spending more than what they get. And you could also see the effect of the shock of COVID-19 in 2020 the revenue dropped drastically, Why the expenditure increased drastically. And because it was a shock, after that situation is now gradually moving together. And this is the effect. You can clearly see that deficit as such. Over the years, this is the national government deficit as a percentage of GDP. And you could clearly see in 2020, you see it went up to 9.5% of deficit. Remember I said in the stability path, the, the, the maximum should be 3%, but now we are at 9.5% of GDP. And this is why you see the high debt in South Africa. But this COVID pandemic, like I mentioned, it affected every other country, not only South Africa, but most countries in the world. And it, but the 2019 pandemic wasn't the expenditure situation in South Africa. And you will see also that in South Africa, the debt rate was around 56% in 2019. But the COVID-19, you could see that sharp rise to 68%, more than 12% of increase in that debt. And this raised concern among different role players in the economy as to ask, is this debt good? 
And it is mentioned that high debt level, if they allow to go beyond the country's productive capacity, it will likely affect growth. And that is where you see that a lot of discussion and concerns have been raised about the fact that is this debt, is it good, is it acceptable, what is happening. But before we go to analyze the debt situation, let's look at the various types of debt in South Africa. So looking at the graph, you see this is the national government debt as a percentage of GDP. You, you see in South Africa, we are just around the 71, but we are still with, within the medium high level. And this is the foreign debt in South Africa. The foreign debt is a bit stable over the years. And you could see the highest is around 8% of the GDP of the country. The South Africa debt is mostly domestic. This green line is the domestic debt. And the orange, I don't know the color you see, is the total public debt of government debt. But you could see that the domestic debt is closely related to the public debt to say, there has been a, almost a constant amount of foreign debt which the South African government borrows, but the domestic debt, if the, if, if the government takes more debt, the debt is more from the domestic debt and not foreign. And that is why you see, and you see during the, the global financial crisis in 2008, you could see a sharp fall and where the country reduced the debt, but with the global financial crisis in China and the aftermath, debt started increasing till today, as you see on that graph. So the debt in South Africa is more domestic, as I explained, and not foreign. And you could see if the South African government takes maybe 50%, let me say 63% of debt, majority is domestic debt and not foreign debt. And that is why Jotane 2014 stated that if we have to construct, that countries should concentrate more on the domestic debt, because even most African countries do use domestic debt to finance their budget deficit. So it is clear that most of South Africa debt is domestic. And this rising debt that has led to debate around the world to say, why this high debt? What can be done? I want us to talk about some measures of debt reduction. How can debt be reduced? One of the measures which debt can be reduced is by debt default. A default is a situation where you do not meet the, the country does not meet the obligation that is stipulated. So if they agree to say this is what they will pay, they, don't, they did not do. And because of this, because of default, most countries will not experience a high borrowing cost. And this affects the entire country, the, 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 the confidence and all of that. So we, and we could see, I remember at the beginning when I explained the issue of most African countries whereby they, they, they had the, the debt rate was low, but the, expense, the interest payment as an expense was high. This is one of the reasons. Most African countries default on their debt in the 1960s. They didn't meet their obligation. Hence, if they borrow with the European countries, the debts for the African countries will be charged a higher interest rate because they know that they might likely default again. They might likely not meet up with their financial obligations. Another way of debt reduction is debt restructuring. This is a situation whereby the government change, you change the terms of the debt, the, the terms of the debt. Maybe if you took debt for 10 years, you now postpone to 15 years to reduce the instrument and all of that. But at times for a government, it is difficult because for a, for a nation, remember a nation borrows from a lot of organizations. To bring all of those organizations to come into terms to agree and extend maybe the period of payment or decrease the instrument is, is a lot challenging. But for a country like South Africa, what could be used to reduce debt would be inflation. And this inflationary debt reduction is a situation whereby you say money should be created and used by the creditor to pay their debt service, to, for government to use for their expenses, health, education, and all the like. But that, and there, are even new, uh, there are even new theories, like the modern monetary theory, which is now common, whereby they are saying that macro, whereby they are proposing that government should actually create money, an unlimited amount, and use it for public spending. But the challenge with this is that, even though it could be done in a country like South Africa, where the debt is mostly domestic, but the challenge is that it will be high inflation in that country. And when inflation is high, we all know the effect of inflation. It affects the poor, it reduces savings, and it causes more inflation. It becomes something out of the range. While South Africa government, they are one of their macroeconomic policies is to have a fixed inflation target. 
hence this measure. Even though it is good for countries whose debts are mostly domestic, it cannot be used. Another measure for debt, for debt reduction is financial repression. And this measure also is good when the debt is more domestic. So these two are good for South Africa. And what, when we talk about financial repression, we are talking about the implementation of government policies whereby the funds are channeled into coffers from deregulated environment. According to Rehan, Rehan and Rogoff 2012, this could be a situation where instead for the government to go and borrow from the banks or other funds, they could rather go and borrow from pension funds. They should rather go and borrow from domestic banks or the cap and interest rate. Or they, they have a regulation on cross-border movement of capital and also tightening the, the connection between government and the bank. So these are some of the measures that could be used. The other two measures also, which most economies do use, is growth. And according to Nelson 2013, an expansionary physical policy and monetary policy can be used to stimulate growth. And when these policies are used, even though at a certain stage, debt will increase, but later on the debt will decrease and the interest rate as well. But some of these also will need some structural implementation. And when that is done, structural reforms that should be implemented, and when that is done, it will increase the growth of that country. And when the country grows, obviously you will see the debt rate reducing. And that is why you see the European countries and the US, despite the high debt level, when you look at it as a percentage to GDP, they are fine. And irrespective of the amount, they have a lot of growth that can cover and cater for the interest payment. The last measure of debt reduction is physical consolidation, which is mostly used. And according to Amotaye et al. 2012, this involves a situation where there is a reduction in government spending and an increase in taxes. And when this happens, you see interest rate being high and also substantial physical adjustment, like I've just mentioned. And each measure of debt reduction has got its effect. It has both the positive and the negative. It just depends on the government of that country, which one is best. Which policy are they focusing on? Then they will choose which of these to implement. And this led us to the discussion of sustainability. Because of this challenge of which measure to implement to reduce debt, it leads us to debt sustainability. Debt sustainability, as defined by Giotani 2014, is a way of ensuring that the government should not spend up to out of an amount which is supposed to spend. Hence, they target the long term, and that should be done in the long term. Why Ma 2003 defined that sustainability as the country being able to service its debt without building on protracted areas. The IMF also defined it to say it's a condition whereby the borrower can pay off its debt without making any excess future correction. Then we say in that situation, Debt is sustainability, it's sustainable. And sustainability is linked to solvency. When debt is sustainable, we talk about solvency. And it's a country's ability to be able to service its debt in the long run. So when a country has got adequate revenue to meet its obligation, then we don't even have issue of insolvency because they have the money. The revenue is more to take care of the expenses and others. Hence, we will not talk about solvency. But where the challenge comes is when the revenue is not much, hence they are struggling. The solvency crisis come as well as the liquidity. There are theories about debt sustainability, but I'll talk about one today, which is the intertemporal budget constraint. The intertemporal budget constraint is a situation whereby the government spending should be within the fund that is available for a period of time. And this intertemporal budget constraint, as you see, is the debt, the interest payment, the initial amount, the interest payment of that original debt minus the primary balance. And this intertemporal budget constraint shows that the primary balance will be equal to the present stock of the net debt. And government should back that by the expected cash flow. This was agreed by Bonnie Seid that where he mentioned that the, the net nuisance of debt is equal to the interest payment minus the balance and the seniorage. But Bonnie 2004 disagreed and said this is just an and a constraint which is imposed on the debtors. And Bond 2005 went further to introduce a model-based sustainability, whereby it generalizes the intertemporal budget constraint to a world of uncertainty. And it assumed that the creditor is an optimizing agent so that the government does not have to have a negative debt in the long run. 
So there are studies, as you see on the board, that were done for South Africa in particular. You will see March 2003. And these studies were done for South Africa for different periods and years. Some use quarterly, while others use annual data. And different techniques, analytical techniques were used. But the conclusion was that all of them are saying the same thing. Debt is sustainable in South Africa. So we can clearly conclude now that debt is sustainable in South Africa. And also, one thing you should take note of that debt in South Africa is mostly domestic. And because it's mostly domestic, we don't have much burden on the sustainability issue because it's within the country. It could be managed. Also, another advantage that South Africa does has about debt is the fact that they have a lot of foreign reserve in terms of gold. And the Reserve Bank of South Africa, which is their monetary policy institution, is well managed such that it can be able to control certain macroeconomic shocks and situations. So because the, 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 the Reserve Bank of South Africa, which is a monetary policy, is far good in terms of the management of the macroeconomic policies, hence, people should not focus more on the debt, but believe also in the institution that manages these policies. And for, that is where you see in, from literature what becomes new and current is no longer sustainability of debt, but now debt is it sustainable to a certain threshold because obviously it's sustainable. And when we talk about threshold, as I mentioned, it's a specific limit whereby if debt goes beyond that limit, it becomes detrimental to the economy of that country. And as defined by Tran 2018, this threshold, some countries will say physical limit, debt ceiling, is that maximum amount of debt that the government is willing to incur. And this debt threshold is always expressed as a percentage of GDP, the gross domestic product of a country. When that ratio, and this ratio of the, of the debt threshold ratio, it helps us when you look at that debt threshold ratio, you, you are able to know, okay, can this country be able to service its debt? And it helps us to say, no, can we go beyond, or if we go beyond, the debt is detrimental. It means any debt incurred has a negative effect on the economy and not a positive one. And most sovereign, sovereign countries have their debt threshold. The debt threshold of South Africa is not as the same for Zimbabwe or Cameroon. Each country, based on what they have, they have their specific debt threshold. And crossing this threshold has got certain consequences, whereby the government will be forced now to either cut on expenditure or increase taxes and all the like. And different countries can choose the threshold they do one for the economy, but the IMF, which and other international financial institutions and World Bank, they often provide guidance and recommendation to find a sustainable level and a debt threshold. And when the debt threshold, threshold is low, it means it is affecting that country because look at the case of the COVID-19. If let's say we had a, as a country a debt threshold of say 50% of debt to GDP, with a COVID-19 we'll be limited not to borrow. And you can obviously envisage the impact. What, what if money was not pumped into the country to handle that situation, what the effect would have been on, that, on the country? So hence, when estimating this threshold, it should not be too low. And also, it should not be too high. Because on the part, when it's too high, or it's, it doesn't even exist, it will make the country to borrow and even borrow without use, borrow more excessive, and it might go out of control. So this goes to say the determination of the appropriate debt threshold is very important. And this could be done by looking at the debt to GDP ratio, revenue generation capacity. Can it generate more revenue? the economic growth as prospect, po the, the potential risks as well. Hence, all of these should be considered when doing debt sustainability. So public debt threshold. What is wrong? OK, sorry, thank you. So when you look at the public debt threshold in South Africa, I went further to estimate the public debt threshold in South Africa, and you see. I did for the total debt. You see this GD is a government debt. You see the threshold is 
299. For the domestic debt is 41, and for the foreign debt is 3.5. Any debt amount above this means it has a negative effect on the economy. But if it is below, then the effect on the economy is not that negative. Now the question comes with debt threshold. Is this debt good or bad? And that was a question which we had. Public debt is vital for the development of a country. And government must have to spend to develop the country and pave way for a better future. Hence, the answer as to debt is good or bad would depend on certain situations. The first one is economic development. If debt is used to finance critical infrastructural projects, promote industrial development, invest in education, health, technology, an initiative that will stimulate growth and development, then that debt is good. But if it is used on the contrary, then that debt is bad because now it will have a negative effect on the economy. Debt also is good if it is used to stabilize short-term macroeconomic fluctuation, the current case of the COVID-19, whereby the government could quickly borrow money, as you saw on the graph, and be able to solve and mitigate what was going on. In that case, debt is good because the impact or the effect of that debt bear more fruit as compared to if that debt was not taken. So with this, in the crisis situation, if the government takes debt, debt is good. But also, the effect of that debt also would depend on the physical multiplier, the output effect of the additional expenditure and tax. So on the output effect, that, that is when we see. Another point to conclude if debt is good or bad is the debt repayment capacity. When, you, when we check the capacity to generate revenue of a country and manage its debt obligation, if they can generate more revenue and manage, then the debt is good. Because when they take that debt and they use it, the government debt, and they use it effectively and efficiently, it produces more fruit, whereby from what is generated, they are able to pay off the interest, which is an expense, and still have much more. But if that debt repayment capacity is not good, there is a problem. And that is why you see the European countries, most of them do have high debt level. And if they still go to the IMF and the World Bank, they will still be given much debt because they have that debt capacity, the payment capacity. Another aspect also is sustainability. When debt is sustainable, debt is good. As long as you could, you could pay your interest, pay the, the instrument and what is required as a government, debt is good. But if it's not sustainable, it's a disaster. Hence, in that case, you do not need to have debt. Another point is a threshold. Debt is good within a certain threshold. Above a certain threshold, debt is bad. So if you've reached your threshold, you go beyond, the debt becomes detrimental. And I'm talking about government debt, not personal debt. <laughs> Another aspect is interest rates and inflation. When there are high interest rates and inflation, for example, the case of South Africa with a high interest rate now, you could see that it affects the, as the, 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 the it, because the interest rates are high and the inflation are high, you see that the payment or the instrument on the interest payment is high. And hence, it might get to a point where it becomes unsustainable. And when those are high, the, the debt is bad. But when it is low or within an acceptable level, debt is good. Another point is the foreign exchange rate whereby we look at the case of South Africa where it, rely, it relies more on foreign dominated exchange rate currencies. And when there is a fluctuation in that exchange rate, it affects the cost of paying debt. And hence, debt, when the interest rates are high, debt is bad. But when the interest rates are low, the debt is good. Another point is the political stability and governance. When there's political, when the country is stable, when the debt management is transparent, when other aspects of the are vital, then whatever debt is taken, that debt is good because there's accountability, there's transparency, there's stability in that economy. But if it is not, debt is bad. And investors' confidence, which is the last point which I'll talk about, when, when there is prudent management of sovereign debt, we can ha it, has co it, creates, it makes investors and other international organizations to believe in the credibility of that country. So when borrowing, when this also, the confidence of investors affect the debt, that is why you see the interest payment on the debt. Even though African countries do have low debt, but you see that interest payment as an expense is higher than 
the, the European countries because they are afraid that maybe we might not pay. And because we, they don't have that confidence in certain African countries, it makes them to charge higher interest rates as compared to other countries. Mr. Deputy Vice Chancellor, I'll conclude by saying, Africa and South Africa is not the only country that do have high debt. As we saw, many European countries currently around the world do have the highest debt as compared to many countries around the world. And the name poor in the highly indebted poor country is not true because a country having a debt level at that time should not be tagged poor because like we've seen, Croatia, Greece, they are having debt above 200, 600% of debt to GDP ratio. Hence, <laughs> let me stop there. So, <laughs> South Africa has a significant amount of reserve from, in the form of gold. And also the monetary policy management system by the South Africa Reserve Bank is good. Hence, we should be at peace and encourage people to believe in the South Africa Reserve Bank, how they manage this aspect because they are good. Debt in South Africa is mostly domestic. Also, most use measures of debt reduction is restructuring, like we mentioned, default, inflation, economic growth, financial repression, and physical consolidation. Even though debt in South Africa is 71%, it is sustainable and it is within the acceptable debt threshold level. And we could clearly see South Africa is 71 now, but it's within the medium high debt. It's not yet a high debt. And the question of is debt good or bad? It depends on how it is managed, the purpose for which it is used, and the overall economic context. No country can do without some amount of debt, particularly when the debt is well managed and is used for investment that benefits the country and its citizens. Mr. Deputy Vice Chancellor, looking at the growth of South Africa of 0.8% per annum is quite low and below the population growth rate of, 30, of 3%. And hence, looking also at the issue of load shedding, like we keep seeing, the unstable electricity supply and other logistics and corruption, there is need to start rethinking about debt. But the debt should be used for prudent investment combined with the responsible debt management practices and physical policy. And to achieve that, it is a long-term financial stability. It needs a long-term financial goal to be done. However, over reliance on debt, without a clear plan of how that debt will be paid, of if that debt is sustainable or not, is detrimental to the economy of our country and the future generation. It is essential then to strike a balance between the sovereign debt, the sovereign debt and the way it is taken and the way it is used in the long run. And with this high debt, like I earlier mentioned, debt services becomes high, but hence, and the government expenditure. But ba and based on the projection, like I earlier showed you on the national treasury, you'll see that the interest rate will increase. Hence, the prudent physical policy is needed. Although it seems, I've spoken a lot, my position is as follows. Debt, sovereign debt is good for a country when it is sustainable, when it is within a specific debt threshold, when it is managed and when it is used for developmental projects. A country like South Africa will continue to need sovereign debt in order to finance its budget deficit like we saw over the years. Debt is, uh, expenditure is always higher than the revenue, so we always need debt as a country. And also the ESCOM, they will always, the government will always need to put money into ESCOM, Transnet, and finance development and corporate project. I make the statement not to encourage debt, but rather to stir a thought process that may result in a new way of looking at debt, which is, is that debt sustainable? Has it reached the threshold? Is it good for that economy? Is it well managed? Then in that case, debt is good. And my statement is that according to Romans 13 verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt of loving one another and, what, and whoever loves others has fulfilled the law.
I just have this one slide about uh, capacity building. I've supervised five PhD students to completion and 10 masters. And it's the two students you see on the picture, they are here. That is Dr. Ivan Kalodikwe. He's there. The one whom you see me on the picture, there is Dr. Paul Modisani. She's there. The one you see on the picture. Others could not make it, and others are out of the country. I was a chief editor, also, I've also supervised more than 10 master's students to completion. I was a, a chief editor of a guest, I was a guest editor of the Journal of Reviews and Global Economics, whereby we had to, I had sent out the call, look for reviewers, go through the processes, reject, accept the paper, and finally publish those accepted in a special issue. That was done in 2019, and I've published 28 articles, it's like I'm, I've gotten the secret now. So, Pro Verona, get ready. <laughs> She's my deputy dean research. I've also attended, published in two books chapter, and attended 11 international conferences. I do enjoy math. That is why mathematical economics and econometrics is my best, is figures. So I just want to thank the almighty God who has been with me till this far. I want to thank Prof. Sonia Swanepoel, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Community Engagement uh, and Campus Operation at Mafiken Campus. She was my dean previously when I was doing my master's. She would encourage us, you come to the office, you need to agree when will you finish, when are you submitting, so she pushed me as well. So I want to say special thanks to her. Special thanks goes to my colleague in the department, the economics department, Prof. Choga, Ms. Tebe, Mr. Lenoke, and all. Special thanks goes to the, the School of Economics and Management Sciences, the Faculty of Economics and Management Sciences as well, and the entire Northwest University. I'm so grateful for all that Northwest University has done for me. I also want to thank Cindy, ST, Nambulelo, Esme, and all the others. I'm so grateful for all the support. I want to also thank my supervisor, Prof. Janine Mokodem-Peterson. She could not be here because of other commitment. And late Prof. Mark Peterson, who is of late, Prof. Itumeleng Mongali. The three of them were my PhD promoter, but Prof. Mark passed on. So I just want to thank them. I want to thank also Prof. John Kumalo. He helped me during my honors. Those were the people who helped me in research, who started that work with me. And Mr. Tansi Max at the University of Boyawe. Those were the first steps in research writing. I also want to thank Prof. Wolem Sama. He was one of my lecturers on undergraduate level. He made me, it was his course that I failed, and I had to do it twice. And that was where I fell in love with economics. Till today, I love economics because of him. Special thanks goes to my mentor, Professor Tebogo Musikari. Prof. Musikari, I just want to thank you for your mentorship. Prof. Musikari is that one colleague. We, are, we have almost the same interests. He will be the one to go around, look for the new method, the new analytical techniques, and all of that, and the current issues. Then he will come and share with me. I will not waste time go. I will just focus on that which he has said. As I go, I go deeper, and I become an expert there. <laughs> <laughs> And as a program leader, if you want sound decision, I go to him. He's, he's not emotional. He's very calm and in-depth. And when we speak, I listen because I know he's in-depth. Thank you for your mentorship, Prof. I also want to give thanks to late Prof. Mavetera. He will always tell me, my girl, I want that PhD. Whatever is happening, that's your problem. Me, I want that PhD. And those words push me to become a doctor. I also want to thank Prof. Nwana Tobeka. She's not here today, but I want to thank her. It's one of the female economics which I met. I thought I was a Buddhist. I met someone who is three times more than me. She will, she's a hard rock to reckon with. She's a hard one to reckon with. I just want to thank her. She will push me. She will encourage me. I want to thank Prof. Dan Ocheri at the Concordia University in Canada, Prof. Molem Sama, Prof. Ita, who is not able to be here. All of these people help also to shape me. I want to thank colleagues from other universities who are here. Dr. Emmanuel Etun from TUT. 
There he is. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank uh, uh, Prof. Mary Asim. She could not come because of health issue. I also want to thank Prof. Helen Du from Vet University. I saw her. She walked in. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. I also want to thank uh, the PUSH group. The representative could not make it because of health issue here. I want to thank the Christian Missionary Fellowship International. That was the first church where I started with in Cameroon. And here represented is Brother Ivan and Brother Josh. Thanks for coming all the way. I want to thank my pastor, Reverend E.G. Seleka, the pastor of Negai Butabelo Discipleship Church. I have been under his leadership for the past 12 years. So thank you, Muruti. <laughs> Special thanks goes to my friend, Dr. Christelle Minyago. <laughs> I remember a, a friend, <laughs> Mboma in particular, who say, how can two people have the name Zell in their name? She's Zell, Christelle. They go and do economics, and they are stingy. <laughs> So thank you, Chris, for this work. We started on us together where we, we will teach each other, we will critique each other. When it comes to our work, we are very critical. With others, we are soft. If I give her the work, I know everything will be right because we have that critical mind. Thanks so much. I want to also thank the Cameroonian community who have also impacted my life so well. That is Prof. Ateba. Prof. Ateba, in 2012, if you did not step in to help me, maybe I will not be where I am today. I just want to say thank you so much. And I appreciate your continuous mentorship to me. I really appreciate. Prof. Avistus Agwo, thank you so much for being that good friend and that mentor. Thank you so much. I also want to thank Prof. Lekunze, who is not here today, but the wife is there because of other commitment. Thank you so much. I want to thank Dr. Bechuke Andre and Dr. Epo CLC. We started the old days where we would struggle in order to meet up with expensive. We have to struggle to do hair. We have to struggle to sell a few things. But it was a wonderful moment. We grew so close together. So thanks, Dr. Bechuke and, <laughs> and Dr. Epo C. I also want to thank my big daddy, Uncle Semenge. Big Daddy. <laughs> we call him Big Daddy. He's that father. He always asks, does Giselle have food? He will meet anyone. Take this, go and give to her. Take this meat, go and give to her. And it meant so much. I just want to say thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I want to thank most of my colleagues. Uh, uh, Prof. Nuche, thank you so much, Prof. Clovis. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. I also want to thank my mother. She was not able to make it, but I'm so grateful to her and my mother-in-law. My mother is that pillar, and I'm grateful. And my father-in-law, I'm so grateful to him. If not of his financial support, remember, as Prof. Dan mentioned, I went to UK. I left my job. I went to UK. Then I came back ground zero. Imagine working, having money, being able to do things on your own and being the boss. Then you come to a point where you need a run for sweet or norox if my father-in-law didn't step that time i don't know what i've become because i remember even i'm a daddy's girl i'll sleep with my father on the bed he'll be tossing on the bed i'm like daddy why are you worried he's like giselle now you look at the way you wear now you've traveled your back what do i do to you how do i send you to school i told him daddy don't bother when the time comes god will raise money and give me and behold that was when my father-in-law one of my uncle in Canada and one in the U.S. For the first time, they came from nowhere. They put money together with my father. And I had to travel back to South Africa to start. So I just want to thank them. Thank Dr. Yota, as I mentioned, my spiritual father for everything. I just want to thank my sibling who could not be able to make it today. Delphine, Vera, Divine, Edwin, Hanley, and Hanley, all of them. My loving husband, I just want to say thank you so much. To my children, I just want to say thank you. To my cousin, Professor Paul Kamta at Czech Eric. I want to say something about Prof. Kamta. He is that agent, that angel of God who always comes for me. When I went to the university, university, I applied the first time to do accounting. I don't know if I applied correctly or what happened. I don't know, but my name did not come out. He was the one who had to go and reapply. So I don't know if he chose economics for me or it was given because I qualified. But I just want to thank him for that. And also when I went to the UK, after I could not study again, 
he was still the one who applied for me to come and study here. So he's that person who always come in for me when I fail in my studies. So I just want to say thank you, Prof. Kamta. And special thanks goes to my cousin, Chek Erin Kamta. He's a cousin, he's a brother, he's a father. He plays all those roles well. I remember <laughs> when he heard my husband was my boyfriend, he was like, how come she said you are dating? It's like he didn't want me to marry. I'm like, but will you get married to me? He was surprised. Like, I'll kill that man. <laughs> <laughs> and even when I moved to South Africa, he would check, he would check. Did you eat? How do you dress like this? Who is greeting you? Your phone call. He's that hands-on father and he will tell you, I don't want you. you. If you need anything, ask me, I will give you. I don't need you to be entangled with anything because you need money. And truly, he will do that. So I thank him not only as my cousin, but also as a father. Thank you. I want to thank my student, Dr. Ivan. He's a director in trade. It's a working day, but he's here. Thank you so much, Doc. And Dr. Paul Modisani, who is here also. Thank you so much, Doc. She works at the airport, and you know they are scheduled now, but she's here. Thank you so much, Doc. And I want to thank my other student, Mr. Victor Mofema, Mr. Paul Lenoke. Those are my young guys. I love them so much. Thank you, and we have a deal. <laughs> I want to thank all the fathers in this house. The fathers play a serious role in the life of the children. Please continue doing that. You do not know how much you impact their life. Continue to do that. I also want to also acknowledge and also tell the female children to say it's not about gender. It's about who you choose and who you want to be. Let your gender, because I'm a woman, not limit you. The sky is your limit. And lastly, I just want to thank my colleagues, all the other Cameroonian community, my church member from Legai Botabelo Discipleship. I can see Ray Malo and the wife, Ostuli, Ostebu, Mamolefi. I also want to thank my colleague, Prof. Choga, Prof. Toku, Prof. Koga, Prof. Peta, Prof. Usikari, you are my sweetheart, Prof. Dan. Thank you so much. I'm just so grateful today. And I want to call forth my cousin, my brother, my destiny helper to come and give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Uh, good evening and uh, congratulations, uh, Ma, on this beautiful and uh, wonderful talk that you've given us this evening. Let me start, Prof. Balia, by making a disclaimer. You see, I hear in some African cultures or traditions, if you go, if you're not well, you go for healing to a traditional healer. If they give you, if he gives you medication and you say, thank you, the medication will not work. <laughs> so, if you leave, after listening to this lecture, if you leave this hall empty-headed, it is because we thanked Giselle and because we thanked the audience. So we just have to do this because it is on our program. It is one of the items. So, but please, if you want the message that you got from Giselle to stay in you, do not listen to the thanks, the word of thanks that we are going to make or give. So, uh, Prof. Dan, I think Giselle mentioned the fact that the first time she applied to study at the University of Boya, her name did not appear. I think she cannot recollect or remember what happened. It's because she was so young at the time, and the father was so protective of her, and he did not want her to travel. So she sent the application by post, and given that the post office is not very organized in the country, so it got lost somewhere, and it never reached the University of Boya. So that is why she was never admitted. So she had to send the application to me. And uh, when I went to university to submit that application, she wanted to study mathematics. Prof. Nuche, Giselle would have been a colleague to you in the maths because she loved figures. But because she had no other choice and she relied on a Nkamta, the, a poor Nkamta, the cousin, I had to choose for her. And I chose mathematics, I mean, sorry, economics. 
That is why today she is your colleague, uh, Irene, and not <laughs> Prof. Uh, Nuche's colleague. Okay. So I think uh, let me go to uh, the vote of thanks. For Balia, I, I will do that vote of thanks in the order in which the items appear on the program. If you if you mentioned last, please do not feel disturbed. It's not because you feel we are less valued. So let me start by thanking uh, Prof. Seleka for opening this uh, event with a word of prayer and uh, ensuring, I think, through your word of uh, prayer, we felt very safe and secured. I knew that we were protected and nothing bad was, was going to happen to us. We also assured that throughout this event, there is no load shedding, there is no power cut. It's because of your prayer. I, also, I want to thank Prof. Verona for the introduction. I was saddened by the fact that you mentioned that Giselle is the last to present this a lecture in FEMS because this is the second I'm attending, second lecture I'm attending in the space of six weeks. So I was looking forward to another lecture. So I hope that next year you will not forget to invite me again. I attended Irene's lecture in August. Uh, today I am here for this lecture. I also want to thank uh, Prof. Dan for doing the introduction. While we were doing the introduction, I was taking notes, and I said, no, I'm going to remind you or to say to you that there is something that Prof. Ma forgot to mention. Fortunately, she mentioned the fact that she was not admitted to the University of Boya for the first time. That is after my intervention that she got admitted. <laughs> so I think today, through your introduction of uh, Giselle, we all know where she began and where she is today. Congratulations, Giselle, on this milestone. I want to thank uh, Giselle for the lecture. I think uh, when she came to South Africa a few weeks ago, let me not mention, disclose when she came, she started with the honors. So given the fact that I took upon the responsibility to apply for her to come study, She's made me really proud that she came, she saw, she conquered, she, she's not disappointed. Congratulations on this milestone. And uh, you've made us really, really proud. Prof. Balia, I want to thank you very much. We know your schedule is very busy, but uh, we want to thank you for taking time off your busy schedule and to travel from Hochestrom to Mahiken to come and grace this occasion. Thank you very much for your presence. I want to thank uh, Giselle's colleagues and her friends who have uh, honored these events this evening. We know that it's a recess. Most of the colleagues are on leave, but I'm sure you decided to come out of your leave to come and support Giselle. Thank you very much for your presence. I think when we attend uh, for events or functions like this, we do not know the work that is done at the, in the background. We want to thank the organizers. We know that there is a lot a, of hard work that is done in the background for such an event to happen. Thank you very much for all your efforts, energy, and time, and for all the resources that you've put together for this event to be a success. Thank you. We, I think a, a few years ago, when I was a student, we used to have inaugural lectures in uh, 106. And I think uh, they used, I used to attend, not because I wanted to get the message, but because I was assured that after the, the lecture, I was going to have a takeaway and uh, a drink. So to the students who are here, thank you very much. If you don't get that, please don't despair know that there are other uh, moments that you have a parcel someday. Uh, last but not the least, Prof. Baya, please allow me to also thank the Cameroonians and the compatriots who are here. Not all of them are in academia. Some of them are in business, but they've been able to close shop, close their businesses to come and support Giselle. It's testimony, it testifies the fact that Giselle is not only in academia, she is a fervent Christian, she attends church, and she also has a social life. 
because of the interaction that she has with the compatriots in Mahiken uh, and beyond, and in other towns or cities of uh, South Africa, that is why they've been able to leave everything that they, they are busy with to come and support her. Thank you very much, the compatriots who are here. On that note, we say thank you to all and enjoy the rest of the evening. Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, friends, all those present here. Thank you for uh, gracing this very auspicious occasion with your presence. It is indeed an honor to have you all here in this hall at the Mahiking campus of the Northwest University. These are obviously not events that we have each and every day. We have classes at our university, but a special occasion like this is one that, uh, that deserves uh, the celebrations that we are taking part in. So the, the first thing uh, that I want to recognize, um, Professor Gazelma, is that uh, this is uh, the culmination of a journey. And we've learned so much about the journey and the various people who have inspired you uh, you know, along this journey and made you who you are and uh, helped you to, um, to achieve what you have achieved and which has brought you to stand in front of us and give the very stimulating lecture. And this is very important for us all to understand that when, when somebody becomes a professor, it is not down... Uh, to individual achievement alone. In fact, very rarely. And that is why it is so important to have you all present here. You are all witnesses and you are all co-workers. You have all helped to make our colleague who she is and what she has become. So the credit is equally to you and especially to your family and friends and to all present who share the joy of, uh, you know, of the journey. I was just thinking if, uh, if God allows and I go to heaven and I, I, I will uh, look for you in the northwest part of heaven because I see in Cameroon you were born in the northwest, you spent so much of your life there and here in the northwest part of this country. So in the next life it has to be in the northwest part. <laughs> we have to reserve your space there. So... Uh, in as much as it is the culmination of a journey, it is the start of a new journey. Because today you have stood tall, we have all uh, stood with you and celebrated your achievements, but we have now, um, we have now uh, looked up to you. We are indebted to you, of course, for inspiring us. Uh, but we will expect more as Northwest University. Your faculty and your colleagues will want to see more of those articles, more of those international conferences. Maybe on uh, the radio we'll hear more of your analyses about the debt crisis. And thank you for the assurance you've given us here, those of us who live in this country and are citizens about the economic state of, of our nation because of all the load shedding 
and the reality of corruption around us and the lack of service delivery, life can be very depressing. But I think as an economist, you have assured us that at the macro level, we're not doing that so bad compared to other countries. Of course, we can do much better and we need to do much better. But with people like you offering advice and teaching uh, our graduate students and, well, all our students, but being there as the voice of reason in these tough, you know, economic times, we feel honored and blessed to have you in our midst, including and especially the Faculty uh, of Economic and Management Sciences. So, uh, on that note, I just want to uh, thank you all again for joining us for this. It is a celebration of academic achievement, you know, of the principle of merit. You've heard it said and you've read it in the program. This is a journey where there have been significant milestones. We didn't confer the title of professor on Professor Ma uh, because we like her. Uh, of course, we do like her. <laughs> she is a very likable person. But it is because of what she achieved, because of the hard work. And you can imagine that being a woman, being a woman is half the battle in a male-dominated world. And then being a black woman, that is another layer of struggle that you have to fight against. And being an African black woman, how much more difficult is that? And then, but you've traversed all the, the barriers, you've, you know, you've been triumphant. And that is why this achievement, you know, this, uh, this uh, celebration was so important for us. So, uh, because of all that was said and what you, what you told us, you know, there's nothing, you know, much that's very original that I have to share with people. But as academics, we pride ourselves on being original in whatever we say and do. So, I, I, and you probably know this, but I think for many of us, I will ask you in conclusion, as I congratulate you, to reflect on the, let's call it the hidden meaning of the name Giselle. Giselle means pledge, to pledge. It's a name signifying honor and devotion. And from what I found on the internet, it says this name is a beautiful reminder of the love and devotion that a parent has for their child. That's exactly, those were even your words that you used when you spoke about your loved ones, especially your mom and dad. And here it's, it's confirmed in terms of the origins of your name. So you're living up to your name in more ways than one. Giselle, it signifies a promise to always be there for your little ones, to guide and protect her and to love her unconditionally. That is the pledge that your father made to you and that is uh, the reason why you have that name. So, clearly from what you have said, you are living up to your name. Northwest University is the chief beneficiary, the community here in my king, and may you grow from strength to strength in the work that you do. Thank you.